Hi, welcome to the third part of our lecture videos about principles of high quality assessments. From our previous lecture videos, we talk about principle number one, clarity of learning targets, principle number two, appropriate assessment methods, principle number three, validity, principle number four, reliability. In this lecture video, we will focus on this other principles of high quality assessments, which are fair assessment, practicality and efficiency, communication, positive consequences, and ethics in assessment. Let us begin with principle number five, fair assessment. A fair assessment is one that provides all students an equal opportunity to demonstrate achievement. Fair assessment eliminate any source of biases. Neither the assessment task nor scoring is differentially affected by race, gender, ethnic background, handicapping conditions, or other factors unrelated to what is being assessed. Did you know that it takes practice to become a fair and effective assessor? Unfortunately, assessment may produce harmful results it may reduce the educational outcomes and it can be demotivating for students as well. That is why it is very important to practice fair assessment. According to Botoroya, interestingly, research shows that growing in fairness and thinking about others lead to higher personal well-being. Being fair-minded helps us develop mutually supportive relationships with those around us. Dweck, Walton, and Cohen in 2014 added that fairness also supports a positive classroom environment, which predicts personal as well as academic flourishing. Pupils are much more likely to try out new skills, be motivated, and earn better grades in an environment where they feel supported and they can expect to be fairly assessed for their hard work. So the question is, what are the indicators of fair assessment for us to do fair assessment in our classes? Number one indicator, student knowledge of learning targets and assessment tasks. As a teacher, you should be transparent. You should inform the learners about the assessment details so that they can prepare for it. So they should be aware about the learning targets. It may answer the question, what are the coverage of the exam? What are the topics to be included? Or what will be the mode of assessment? Is it written test, objective test, or essay type of test? Or is it a practical exam? Is this individual, by group, by pair? And you should also inform them what will be the grading criteria, how they will be graded, what are the major criteria that they will address in order to get good grades. So they should be informed so that they will prepare. Second indicator of fair assessment is this one. Student must possess prerequisite knowledge and skills. Let us remember that you can test the things that you have discussed. You only test the things that you have discussed. It is a little bit impossible to get good grades if you base it on stock knowledge. And it would be unfair if you gave a graded test based on student stock knowledge. Before you conduct a test, at least you address the gap in knowledge and skills. So you cannot test the things that you did not discuss. You can only test the things that was included in your discussion. And you will only test the things that you have informed them on what will be the coverage of your exam or what will be the focus of your assessment. And you have to make sure that they are ready and they are prepared because we want them to pass. We want them to attain the objectives. If the students have attained the objectives, teachers also attain the objectives. Another indicator of fair assessment, all students must be given equal opportunity to learn. 
fairness demands that all, all learners are given equal chances to do well in task and get good assessment score. So everybody must answer the same exam. That, that is as much as possible. They will be answering the same exam and they will be given same amount of time to perform. So if one student will be given 30 minutes, other students must be given 30 minutes to complete the task. And all students will be informed and given enough time to prepare simul simultaneously. If you inform students, you should inform all of them, not just you inform the class officers, you inform your relatives, you inform your friends. So as much as possible, you inform them. Another indicator of fair assessment, avoiding teacher stereotypes. In scoring, teacher should not be affected by students' gender, academic status, socioeconomic background, and even handwriting in checking essays. No, handwriting should not matter. We should focus on the content, on how they address the issues that we frame. Also, students who can and can't speak fluently must be free from discrimination, but should focus on the content. Unless uh, speaking is the nature of the subject matter. So we should not uh, favor students because of their pleasing personality. We should not favor students because uh, it is our relative. So we should uh, treat them fairly. Another indicator of fair assessment is free from biased assessment tasks and procedures. Assessment must be free from any form of biases, especially group assessment. Say, for example, your activity is dancing, and not all students are dancers. So what you can do is you identify those students who are gifted in dancing, you assign them as group leaders and the rest of the students will do a counting or a count off and they will be assigned to the selected students here you can uh, address the biases of task because if you allow one group of students who are good in dancing it would be unfair Another thing is make agreement with students about grading criteria or rubric. Now, as much as possible, you present your rubric to the students. You ask them if they can perform it. You can ask them if there is a criteria that they want to remove or if there are criteria that they want to add. Another thing is Teacher need to consider special need of learners that require accommodations. So there are really students with learning disability. Now there are really students who need more attention from us. And sometimes uh, we assign uh, other students, one of their classmates to assist their classmates so that their classmates can also attain the objectives. I have here a tip for fair assessment. Assessment must consider learners' learning style and multiple intelligence. So you must come up with a variety of methods. Please do not focus on written exams only or on practical exams only. So for example, uh, you focus on written exams. It would put uh, the nonverbal linguistic students at disadvantage so uh, it might be that their uh, multiple intelligence is on other areas so please vary your assessment methods principle number six practicality and efficiency from the word practical and efficient maybe you have heard the word or phrase be practical what does it mean be practical means doing a method that lead to attainment of goal or goals. No? You would attain your goals directly that will allow you to save time, 
You will save effort, you will save money, and other resources. Meaning you address the situation immediately and you did not uh, choose other methods that would cost you, that would trouble other persons. And efficiency means the quality of being able to do tasks successfully without wasting time, energy, and resources. So as much as possible in doing assessment, you should be practical. You will give them an activity that will get desired results. And the assessment activity that you should choose should be appropriate. It should be valid and it should be reliable. Here are the six factors about practicality and efficiency. And the most important with these factors is the familiarity with the method. If you're familiar with the method, you can estimate how long will it take for the students to answer the activity or perform the activity. If you are familiar with the method, you can give directions clearly as possible. And you can also anticipate potential problems if you are familiar with the method. If you are familiar with the method, you know how to score it because you know what are the expected behaviors that you want to see at the end of the activity or at the end of the lesson. And if you are familiar with the method, you can determine or distinguish easily if that particular performance passed the criteria or there, what are the areas that they need to improve. And if you are familiar with the method, you can save a lot of time, you can save a lot of money because you know what are the resources that can be used and still it can provide good quality outputs. Now, here is the problem if you are not familiar with the method. It might uh, ask you to uh, utilize a lot of time because you might be changing instructions from time to time. Your students might also consume a lot of time trying to understand your directions and if you are not familiar with the method you might encounter difficulty in scoring you might uh, also encounter difficulty if a certain performance passed the criteria and what are the other areas that they need to improve in order to pass the criteria and if you are not familiar with the method you might waste a lot of money waste a lot of energy and you may also waste a lot of time. I have a tip for practicality and efficiency. Assessment should emphasize in real world applications rather than out of the world context drills. So we should focus on uh, assessing the lifelong learning skills or our assessment should focus on authentic skills. Those are the skills needed by our students after graduation. So those are the things that will help them to be independent after schooling. Principle number seven, communication. Communication is the key in unpacking assessment results to improve student learning. Let us remember that the main purpose of assessment that we are gathering data is to improve student learning. If we gather the data, if we have collected the data, and if we are not going to communicate the results to learners, nothing will happen to them. They will not know or they will not realize what are the things that they need to improve, what are the areas that they are good at. Uh, we could not achieve that particular goal of assessment to help them improve. We are not giving assessment to fail them. We are not giving assessment to punish them but we are giving assessment in order to help them discover uh, what they learn and help them discover the things that they need to learn. And in communication, assessment results must be fed back to the learners. Fed back the feedback. The first fed back, the one in red, meaning to return the test scores, to return outputs of the students, Feedback, these are our comments, our reactions, these are the test scores, these are the grades. So we have to fed back the feedback to the students. 
And if we are going to fed back the feedback, it will provide opportunity for learners to undergo self-assessment. They are going to ask themselves, what went wrong? What we could have done better? And they are going to realize what, why is it that it is the correct answer that they can still do a lot more. In giving feedback, we should give positive feedback along with the not so good ones. We should appreciate, we appraise the work of our students, we give them encouragement, we compliment their works, but we all know that not all outputs are good. Not all outputs are excellent. There are really students who are struggling. So there are outputs that are not appealing to us or it doesn't meet our standards. Still, we need to give positive feedback. We need to identify the good things that they have done. So for example, let us have this situation. A student is trying to submit a very late output with mediocre quality. Now, still you need to give positive feedback on that. You have to appreciate that you thank him for the effort, you thank him for the initiative, meaning you stress out the strengths. And then after you identify the strengths, that is the time that you need to identify that he needs to improve. Like saying, maybe next time you can submit your work a little bit earlier and you can uh, look into details. You try to look at the criteria so that your output will match to the expected outputs as stated in the rubric or the criteria. And lastly, you give him a challenge and let him know that you believe in him. I believe that next time you can submit a better output and next time you can submit it on time or earlier. So we should also give, again, positive feedback along with the not so good ones. And these not so good ones, these are the students who need most of our attention. These are the students that will require us to provide more accommodations. Next, results of learning must be communicated regularly and clearly to parents. So we should inform the parents because they are the ones sending the learners to school. Parents are our partners. No, we are business partners with parents because we have the same goal. We want the learners to learn something. We want learners to develop his uh, morals. We want the learners to earn values. And I guess there is no teacher and no parent wants his learner to fail. So that is why parents and teachers are partners. Now, I stress out the word regularly. It doesn't mean your parents will be called weekly. It doesn't mean your parents will be called monthly. If that is the case, there is something wrong with your attitude. It might not be related to assessment. When we say regularly, you inform the parents at the beginning of the class in a PTA meeting. And the second schedule would be after the first uh, convocation program. And second convocation program, third convocation program. And you also have, lastly, the closing. So these are the regular schedule that we report to parents. We report and we identify which of the areas in the class standing that they missed and what is their grades after the first grading period. And re in relation to communication, did you know about BP232 or Batas Pambansa Bilang 232, also known as Education Act of 1982. This one, it stipulates the rights, duties, responsibilities of teachers, parents, school head, non-teaching personnel, learners. And in Chapter 2, Section 8, Paragraph 2 of BP 232, it states that all parents who have children enrolled in school must have the following rights the right to access to any official record 
directly relating to the children who are under their parental responsibility. So that is the right of the parents. And that is our duty to report to parents regularly. And also in chapter 3, section 16, paragraph 3 of the same law, it states that one of the obligations and duties of every teacher is to render regular reports on performance of each student and learner's parents or guardians with specific suggestions for improvement. So we try to detail what are the things that they need to improve because again, assessment will help the students to improve. Principle number eight, positive consequences. The term positive consequences came from B.F. Skinner's operant conditioning theory. He coined positive consequences as it often referred to as reinforcement is a means by which teachers can increase the probability that a behavior will occur in the future. Positive consequences. Assessment should develop motivation and driving force for more learning opportunities. I know there's a lot more that you can mention the other positive consequences of assessment. Another thing, Assessment should never be used as punishment or disciplinary measure. Because there are some teachers will announce exam or quiz if the class is very noisy. If the class is very noisy, the teacher will say, get one portrait of paper, number one, number two, number three. The teacher is using assessment to discipline the students to make them silent. I would say that it is effective, but we should not do it from time to time because that is already an abuse to assessment. So they would think that assessment is just a form of punishment. Another thing, if a lot of students fail to bring their books, this is very common in, in high school, the teacher will declare a test. And if there are few students who brought their books, the teacher will declare open books. And majority of the students who fail to bring their books will be punished or will, will suffer because they cannot open their books. Another thing, assessment is an integral part of teaching learning process, something absolutely needed after instruction. One of the purpose of assessment, again, is to check the learning of the students. And it will also determine what are the things that they have clearly understand? What are their misconceptions? What are the things that they are having difficulty? You know? If you are going to give an assessment after teaching, you would be able to discover these learning gaps. What are the things that they learn? What are the things that they are having trouble with? And you can address that one right away after the assessment. So assessment is an integral part of teaching learning process and it will bring positive consequences because you can discover a lot of things after the exam. Assessment tools should match with the performance objectives. This is closely related to principle, principle number two of the principles of high quality assessment, appropriate assessment methods. This one, this will bring positive consequences because the students will enjoy answering your assessment. They might say, there is no challenge in the assessment because everything was discussed. The skills was practiced in the teaching learning process certified during the assessment activity. The activities that the students are doing in the teaching process is the same to what they are answering in the assessment. So they will enjoy answering your assessment. Principle number nine. Ethics in assessment. Ethics is a code of moral standards of conduct for what is right or good as opposed to what is bad or wrong. Ethical behavior refers to the question of what is right and what is wrong. So teachers need to ask themselves if his decisions are right, correct, 
or appropriate to the given situation. So we need to reflect. And ethics of uh, assessment centers on fairness. So this is like ethics and fairness are closely related and they must go together. And here are some of the ethical issues in assessment that students have been experiencing. Number one, confidentiality of test results. Test results are kept confidential to the concerned learner. Now, this is uh, an issue because sometimes some students will see the results of other students and confidentiality is broken if other students will learn your scores from your teacher. Second, giving the right score. Is the teacher giving the right and deserving score without any mental reservations? Now, I know a lot of students would say it's unfair because he is given higher points because of blah, 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 blah. So this is an issue. Another thing is concealment. Teachers do not reveal all the relevant details or not the whole truth or incomplete disclosure to the learner or parents. So there are some details that the teacher is not informing the parents so that the parents won't be hurt or if there is pain, uh, less pain. Another thing would be deception. When the teacher is intentionally not telling the truth, it is very painful if the teacher won't tell uh, the truth. Another thing is affected judgment. Teacher's judgment is clouded due to relationships, friendships, power, and prestige. A relationship to the learner. If it is your nephew, it, if it is your cousin, friendship. Uh, the parents of the kid is your friend or is your neighbor. Power and prestige. It's the kid is a son or daughter of a prominent family in the community or the parent is a major donor in your school or in your classroom. So it might cloud your judgment. Another thing is coaching or assisting. Temptation of teachers to coach or assist certain individuals during tests. Now, there are instances that students will ask questions to the teachers and teachers will selectively address the questions, but for some, he won't be answering the questions. This one, bribery of grades. Some parents, and learners will ask grades in exchange of gifts. So they will bring gifts to you in exchange of money and sometimes in a form of donations. And other ethical issues in assessment might result to the biases and scoring errors in evaluation. And I have a separate video about these biases and scoring errors I will place the link below so find time to watch the biases and scoring errors in assessment. And did you know that we have the code of ethics for professional teachers? The code of ethics for professional teachers serves as guide for all teachers for them to exhibit proper behavior to the learning community at all times. It is imperative that you observe and practice this set of ethical and moral principles, standards, and values. So as teachers, we are guided with this code of ethics for professional teachers. And that would be all for this session. I hope you learned something. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.